interesting thing about the, the turntable, it runs at 7 to 8 RPM, so you could buy an attachment so you could play your records and, t and dub them onto the wire. So you could actually have all your favourite 78 records on to run for an hour. <laughs> uh, I started recording in about 1948, 49, when I built a disc cutting machine from bits and pieces that I bought from a guy called Royce who had a Royce Studios, uh, a Royce Recording Studios in Little Burke Street, I think he had, he used to cut records of people doing cheerios to send them to people across the world during the war years and things like that. Um, and I bought a turntable from him and I made a, uh, the lathe top uh, in the engineering school at Caulfield Tech. They had, in those days, Caulfield Tech was, uh, even had a blacksmithing shop. It's now Monash University. I was doing, what do you call, well, uh, review, review uh, where did you go for school sort of thing. I said, oh, Monash University. So hang on. <laughs> it's Monash now, but it's, <laughs> it was Caulfield Tech then. Um, so uh, I made a uh, disc cutting machine uh, and with the help of uh, Neil McRae, who you probably know, uh, who lived down the road from me, um, built an appropriate amplifier and I bought a cutting head from Max Buyer made disc cutting equipment those days. So uh, I was able to, uh, in the, the sort of back ante room of, my house, which was my room, uh, which faced onto a veranda which was enclosed with an open big room that had a piano in it. So it was quite often that uh, musos like Glenn Bernard and Bob Bernard and uh, other, John Sangster amongst the others that come along and like to hear themselves back, so they come down back room and I'd record them onto a, an acetate and play it back to them. Uh, then in, uh, that was always difficult. Uh, I did occasionally took this kind of machine out somewhere, but that was uh, a real drama to be cutting discs uh, on location. But I, in 1949, uh, the generosity of my parents, I bought a Pyrox wire recorder. Uh, at that time, tape wasn't, it was in uh, Europe and possibly in America, but uh, there were no tape machines here. But wire recorders were the go and radio stations. Every radio station had a Pyrox wire recorder, which were pretty good. And I've still got the one here that I bought in 1949. So that enabled me to uh, do portable recording, of which I did a lot of, uh, in particular the 1949 Jazz Convention at the Paran Town Hall. So I would record hours and hours of uh, jazz music and cut it onto acetates for uh, the bands who wanted to buy an acetate from me. Uh, still, a few of those acetates still hang around, but. Um, and I think I've actually still got a few of the wires that still play and play very well. I've certainly got a concert that I did with Graham Bell in the uh, Melbourne Town Hall. I think it was about 1950 uh, of a concert that he did there and uh, playing it back, it sounds pretty good. So they had a frequency response up to about eight. And... Uh, the wound flutter wasn't too bad, but uh, it was in good condition. But uh, if someone was playing a slow piano, you could hear a little bit of flutter or wow. Wow more than flutter. But um, then the next step was to uh, acquire a tape machine, which Max Beyer made extremely good tape machines. If a lot of people would you'd remember... Uh, the Bayer 77, the red case one that they made for 
the Olympic Games, uh, the ABC being the host broadcaster provided all these uh, booths with these uh, buyer 77s, which I think they were uh, quite amazed at how, what, how very good these machines were and the quality of them. And uh, I don't have that machine anymore, but a few people have got them. I'd, I'd love to acquire one again. In Albert Road, my recollection is uh, the first mixer there, Graham Thurkle made uh, a four channel mixer, uh, a very, very basic mono mixer, because uh, uh, everything was mono in those days, that they're talking about. Um, and that had four inputs on it, and I bought from Phillips, who made uh, uh, the Neil Craig design, a uh, four-channel pass uh, not passive, but a four-channel uh, mixer, uh, which was microphone in, microphone out level. Uh, so I bought four of those, which then gave me, uh, they were about, I don't know, that, whatever that, uh, about nine, ten inches wide by about four or five inches deep with just four controls on them. It was just a microphone in, microphone level out. Uh, so that, with buying four of those and with this, uh, it was coloured yellow, so we used to call it the yellow peril. Um, so then uh, with those four, we had 16 channels uh, and each four, of course, had one master control over it. So that was all mono. Um, now, we that was for quite a while, that was our main mixing. Uh, they were quite... Uh, well, listening to this stuff back these days has sound okay. Um, there weren't any, uh, to my knowledge, mixes you could buy here. There were probably also, there were all sorts of components and bits and pieces we knew about in America or Europe, but they were all mainly, uh, seemed like broadcast type things or, or modules you could buy, but then you had to put them into something. Uh, um, I can't think of the names of the equipment, but uh, Fairchild made a lot of uh, plug-in modules and things like that uh, from memory. Anyway, that survived for quite a while before Graham actually made a, uh, uh, a small console mixer which was, uh, I'll have to look at photographs, but I think it was like 18 and two out, something like that. Um, so that we were in stereo then. Um, and using those in conjunction with a Scully eight track, uh, we got pretty good results, but, but looking back on a very basic <laughs> gear, not much EQ anywhere. I think it was a bit of bass cut, but that's about all. Uh, but by and large, a lot of the microphones actually had uh, uh, bass slope off on them anyway, if you needed. You're just using uh, a Neumann uh, 47. They had little controls on the back of them where you could slope the bottom off and, and they could either be, uh, in most cases, uh, a cardioid or, or figure eight. Some had omnidirectional, but uh, uh, I can't recall. But it, I think mainly the ones we had were the Neumann, I think they were 67s, which were the uh, ones that had car cardioid and uh, figure eight. Anyway, they were, they were uh, very, very good microphones and they're still good today. Um, but that was before uh, 
phantom power came in. They were all separately powered by uh, those little amplified bo uh, uh, power boxes. Uh, we had a small number of uh, other non uh, non-condenser microphones. Uh, some ones made by Steen Sound Systems. Uh, they made a, an exceptionally good uh, ribbon mic called an R47. Uh, I think I had a couple of those. Um, but by and large, uh, the our bike, our main stay were, uh, were were Neumann microphones, um, which even are constantly uh, uh, hard to beat uh, over the years. From even from then, though, the quality was superb. The only thing that really changed was the system of delivery. I, when they became uh, phantom powered and and then had various other switching on them and things like that, but uh, and, and uh, but the I mean the quality of the earlier ones was excellent, and because the facilities and quality of the other ones, I'm sure improved dramatically. But I don't recall it being that much different. But uh, the main thing was the convenience of phantom powering. Um, but we didn't use many other sort of microphones from uh, from memory. Uh, you know, cut much th and tape machines were uh, well. We had the Scully, and then the next step, of course, was uh, Graham Thurkle's sixteen-track machine, which uh, which uh, I was sort of funding the de development of it because. Uh, uh, he probably, uh, Graham was a person who uh, would invent something but be continually changing it and never finishing it, uh, as one would imagine in a factory like Ampex, they would develop a, a machine and then put it into, move, move away from the engineers who invented it and it goes into production and then, then they go out the door with an instruction book and all that sort of stuff. Uh, but uh, I kept feeding him money to uh, m uh, make this 16-track machine, which ultimately he did deliver it, but about a year late. Uh, a, a classic remark of Roger Savage was, because uh, uh, so often it was going to turn up tomorrow or the next day or something, and he said, Roger's classic comment was, don't roll out the red carpet until the truck pulls up. <laughs> Which is, uh, uh, people that know Graham would understand what we mean. <laughs> he was uh, an absolute Edison or genius, but he never could finish things. And uh, it didn't matter, as long as I've known him through all the, years and things that this this was a problem that he he could uh, never freeze the design of something it would he'd almost be walking along changing things <laughs> as he wheeled it in you know uh, so there are all the uh, funny sides of it but he was an absolute genius and uh, uh, it's like all those things what you would done without him uh, nobody can tell but uh, he he was a genius at uh, understanding and inventing, and when you think of those machines, the only parts he didn't make were the tape heads and the uh, transistors, those sort of things. But he made almost every screw, and uh, I think the tape heads he bought in. Uh, but apart from that, he made the motors, the the drive, the cabinets. Uh, his father was a very clever uh, engineer, also, who, who made the frames and, and 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 those sort of things in respect of uh, the making the the hardware that the machine's got to sit into and so forth. Um, so he, uh, you know, 
just a special person that did all those things and we were sad to see him go.